Hello. Bienvenidos. Uh, welcome. Thank you for attending this event. Quick bit of housekeeping. Who here has been to Ward Up or to this space, Recirculation, before? Okay. Quite a few. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to, to Ward Up in this space first before we go into the event. Um, my name is Veronica Santiago Lu, and I'm one of the founders of Word Up, uh, which is a bookshop and art space. We started 11 years ago as a pop up, um, and we stayed open uh, past our original month due to great community support. We operate a, as a collectively run community space. We have a lot of book and art events, we do a lot of other community resource sharing, um, and we are also a nonprofit. So we accept book donations, donation, monetary donations, and also volunteers if you have time to lend. If you like what you see here, please feel free to get involved and support, or especially join as a member. You can join as a sustaining member um, on our site. This place is Recirculation. Um, it came about because one of our early collective members, one of the early Word Up collective members, Tom Burgess, uh, died of COVID in June 2020 and left us in charge of recirculating all of his books and records. So we moved them here and have been sh uh, sharing them with the community on a pay what you can basis. Operating, this is a community space uh, now with the gallery. Uh, we've just started to do events this year. Events such as this. This is a very special event for us at Word Up and Recirculation because it is in honor of one of our favorite authors um, and neighbors a frequent collaborator, um, and as of early 2022 or late 2021, Word Up board member, Angie Cruz. <laughs> From Uptown Reads, a program we started in 2019, to Lomas Lit, a teen book club that we ran throughout the pandemic, to El Gran Combo, there have been so many ideas that we've worked on with Angie um, that have all come to fruition to really great success. We're really proud to be Angie's neighborhood bookstore, really honored to count her as a friend, and we're overjoyed to be hosting this Uptown launch. I also want to um, share something that happened after Dominicana was launched in 2019. At the bookstore, neighborhood bookstore, everyone asked over and over again every day, where is the Spanish edition? <laughs> and you know, the, it's helpful to have that question be asked because there are so many gaps in the publishing industry and the more that that question gets asked, the more that we on the ground can push um, until we were able to make this happen, the uh, Spanish edition of Dominicana, the first. <laughs> I believe the first translation of a Dominican American book by a Dominican American author, Kiani Antigua, who's here in the front row. <laughs> so we're also delighted to share the news here that um, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water will also be available in Spanish with a translation by Kiani. <laughs> Specific date, TBD, but, um, but soon. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Um, and to do a fuller introduction to the incomparable Angie Cruz, we invite another close collaborator and friend, Dominican Writers Association founder, um, Angela Abreu, to the stage. Thank you, Vern. Buenas noches. Como están todos? Thank you for being here. My name is Angie Abreu. My government name is Angela, but don't call me that. My mother calls me that, okay? Angie Abreu and I am the founder of Dominican Writers Association. We are a literary arts nonprofit and our work is focused on amplifying the voices of Dominican authors such as Angie Cruz. Um, if you want to read more books, which is my mission to get a book, a Dominican book into your hand, please follow us on social media and um, our website, dominicanwriters.com. We're open to collaborations and everything crazy and creative that you could think of will probably say yes. Okay, so I want to introduce Angie Cruz. Angie is a very um, special author to me because her book, Soledad, 
touched me in a way that no other Dominican book has. Um, and it was because I related so much to the main character's relationship with her mother. The book is also based on the block I grew up on, so it was very unique to me to be reading this book and me still living there. Um, so if you haven't read Soledad, please, I highly recommend that you do. And to introduce this incredible author, Angie Cruz is the author of novels, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, Soledad, Let It Rain Coffee, and Dominicana, which was shortlisted for the Women's Prize and a Good Morning America book club pick. She is founder and editor-in-chief of Asterix, a literary and, literary and arts journal, and is an associate professor of English and at the University of Pittsburgh. There, oh, there you go, Marlene Ramirez Cancio. Okay. You see, ese, ese nombre merece una introducción. You see, you see? So she is a Puerto Rican cultural producer, artist, and educator based in Brooklyn. She is the founding director of Emerge NYC, an incubator and network for emerging art artists, activists in New York City and beyond, focus on developing the artistic expression of people of color, women, and LGBTQA plus folks. In, in 2021, she brought the incubator to BAX, Brooklyn Arts Exchange, where she is currently part of the leadership staff as the director of Emerge NYC and Practice Lab. The mu though, Mujer Que Pregunta, Marlene works as a process doula to help BIPOC cultural workers to shape their ideas, clarify their purpose, and make sure their projects align with the goals of the practice. She co-founded Fulana, a Latina satire collective whose videos have been shown internationally at film festivals, museums, and universities. Marlene serves in the steering committee, committee of LX New York, Latinx Arts Consortium of New York, the board of directors of the National Performance Network, and the board of advisors of the Action Lab and the Center for Artistic Activism. There you go. Welcome, Marlene and Angie, to the stage. <laughs> and I'm so happy to celebrate here um, and see this space and all its transformation. Thank you, Veronica, for championing all my work, and Carolina, and Emmanuel, and Angie Abru. Like, this is super amazing. And thank you to all. You're my community. Like, I recognize your faces, and I've seen you at events here before, and I feel really moved. Um, the book has been out like a week, and I keep telling this is my real launch because I'm with my people. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I, you know, I'm going to read a little bit just because that way you could hear Cara Romero. Um, since the book has come out, everyone thinks Cara Romero wrote her own book and that I'm just assisting her in the process. Um, I don't even know if I could do her justice, but um, Kiani asked me to read a certain part, so I will, for Kiani, who drove five hours to be here. I feel really privileged to have... Um, my own personal translator, I'm joking. <laughs> she no longer is, she's like the translator of every star right now, but um, I do feel privileged that you made this journey, it means the world to me and to everyone who's come from close and far. Um, okay, so here you go, and then we're gonna talk because you know, Maleng and I have a lot to say. Okay, okay, everybody, we're gonna have fun, okay. My name is Cara Romero, and I came to this country because my husband wanted to kill me. Don't look so shocked. You're the one who asked me to say something about myself. Before we begin, can you permit me to have a glass of water? I actually need that. <laughs> I see, está buena, sí, sí. Okay, ah, yes, thank you. Why am I so nervous? I know, I know, we're just talking. And this water, is it from the bottle? Does it taste strange to you? I've never done something like this before. I didn't think I was going to have to look for a job at this point of my life. La profesora from La Escuelita said that you'll help me. You're Dominicana, no? She said, if you know a lot about me, you can find me a job. Is that true? I could, because I need a job. The factory closed in 2007, right before Christmas. Can you believe that? Almost two years I don't work. In reality, El Obama has been very generous. After the factory closed, I received 53 checks. Then El Obama gave me 13 checks, then 20 more. Did he have a choice? No. There are no jobs. My factory left to Costa Rica. You know they're never coming back. And after those 12 weeks that I meet with you, I'll receive no more checks. Like my neighbor Lulu says, 
El Obama is good, but not God. I'm lucky because I'm 55 years old. Oh, wait. Did I say 55? <laughs> I'm 56. I stopped counting. If I don't, I'll be in a coffin sooner than I'm ready. The point is that I qualify for your senior workforce program. Me, a senior? I told Lulu, I'll be a senior for the checks, but not for the canas. <laughs> I get nervous. Because very easily, after working so hard, you can be with nothing. Pobrecita Tita, she's my neighbor. One day, she's ready to retire to have an easy life. The next day, her life is an inferno. The management have many properties in all of New York. They are so rich. Why do, do this thing to Tita? We all had washing machines for many years, but that was no problem because nobody wanted to live in Washington Heights, only us. But now everybody wants to live in Washington Heights because it's not expensive like downtown. And now the area has the white people bar and the white people gourmet bodega and the $15 white people personal pizza. Not even for a family. $15 for one pizza. In fact, it's more now, but okay. <laughs> Tita thought she could live with the social security and the disability. With the low rent, it was enough. But listen to me, there is never rest for the poor. Now, pobrecita Tita can't pay for her new apartment, so she can't retire. She had to take a job, a terrible job. She saw a paper in the train that said, $10 an hour, no experience necessary. Yes, that's right. The one you see all the time, written by hand on a paper bag. For two days a week, she works, taking care of a vieja. They pay her in cash so she can still get her benefits. But the lady she works for makes Tita sleep on the floor next to her bed. She wants to see Tita all the time. Yes, it's true, incredible. On the floor on a yoga mat. The lady told her that the mat is very comfortable, that in many parts of the world, people sleep on the floor, and how good, sleep, and how good sleeping on the floor will be for Tita's back. Can you believe it? She doesn't care that Tita is old like her. It's true, she looks good for her age, but to make a human being sleep on the floor, no. And what is Tita going to do? She needs the money. Of course, if I am desperate, I would do like Tita. But I hope at this stage of my life, I am not so desperate. Tita is a saint. She works for this lady in the night and does not complain because she prefers to give her daughter the medicine that makes her sleep for 10 hours and go to work. That way, Cecilia doesn't see that Tita's gone. So this week, and until Tita doesn't have to do this terrible job, all of us in the building take turns with Cecilia. Tita's apartment is downstairs. Her apartment shares a wall with Lulu. This is good because we use the walkie-talkie. If Cecilia wakes up, we can run to see if she's okay. Cecilia's not developed in the brain, so she likes, she's like a baby and can't walk, but she's 40 years old. Most nights, Tita says she is calm, but sometimes she wakes up scared, so we listen just in case. She usually gives no problem, but a few days ago, when it was my turn, Cecilia woke up screaming, full of terror. And ay Dios mio, when I arrived, Cecilia was screaming so loud, one hand covering the ear, one arm waving up and down and up and down, the hand hitting the mattress. The neighbors came up out of their apartments. The feathers from inside the pillows were everywhere. The plant, the soil was on the floor. Everything was broken. My neighbor, Gwendali, said, I'm calling the ambulance. Let's call the police, a tall flaco said. Because you know, that's what our new neighbors do now. Any little noise and they call the policia. No, wait, I said. Nothing good comes from calling the police. They can report Tita and social services can take away Cecilia. No, wait, I said. Nothing good. In America, the authorities do many things that don't make sense to me. I've known Cecilia almost all of her life, so I was not afraid of her. The others were afraid because Cecilia does this thing with her eyes where she looks up and around and her scream, it's not a scream, it's like a ee, -ee like an ice pick stabbing in the ears. 
I sat next to her and really fast, I grabbed her with all the strength in my body. I trapped her arms inside mine and I held her fuerte, fuerte. And I did let sound like, mmm. She could feel the hum in my body against her body. You know how the engine feels under the legs when you sit all the way in the back of the bus? Mmm. And she stopped moving back and forth. She got calm. When you have children, oh, that's right, you don't want children. Well, I know. I knew what to do because I did it with my son, Fernando, when he was a baby. It works like magic. Cecilia went to sleep. After, I told everybody to leave because some people were looking at Cecilia like she was some show. I was alone in the apartment. It was so small. Dike one bedroom. But really, it was just two rooms. Tita took the bedroom and has Cecilia sleeping in the living room. It's one of those salas where one wall has the kitchen and the other wall has the sofa bed. I tell you, very small. So small that if you sit on the sofa bed, you can touch the stove. That's where Cecilia sleeps. Why do they make apartments like that? I don't understand why anybody would not want a wall to separate the kitchen grease from the furniture. It's obviously an apartment for someone that does not cook, that does not prepare food. They put two or three things together and say dinner is ready. They only boil water for a tea or an egg. The window looks to a brick wall, so I can imagine it's very dark during the day. How can people live without light? Que tristeza. It's like living in a closet. Pobrecita Tita lives in a closet. I could have gone back to my apartment and sleep, but I stayed with Cecilia because I was awake. So I cleaned. Nobody wants to come home to a mess. I didn't want Tita to see all the broken glass and feathers. I try to wash away the smell of Band-Aid and humidity that gives me the nausea because like you know, I'm very sensitive to smell. But Tita can't help it. All those years working in the hospital, all the bottles of sanitizer and antiseptic she brought home. So I opened the windows to refresh the air and emptied out the fridge. Wiped clean the crusted bottle tops, cleaned all the shelves, scraped the front of the freezer walls. She had only been in the apartment a few weeks, but already the freezer had frost. I scrubbed the oxidation of the st off the sink. I boiled canela and naranja peel so the apartment smelled like compostre. And between us, after I was done, it was a different apartment. No offense to Tita. I mopped the floors two times. Yes, I don't mind to clean. To do it every day for money, I don't know. I can think about that. We can talk about the possibilities. But what I was saying is that I waited for Tita to arrive sitting on a hard chair. It was so uncomfortable, a torture really, looking to the brick wall outside the window. The only light was a horrible fluorescent bulb in the ceiling. What kind of life is this? She lives in El Close and the rent more than what she used to pay. She works every minute she's not taking care of her daughter. At least in my apartment, I have a view from the living room window. On a clear day, I swear to you, I can see the George Washington Bridge. To have a view in Manhattan is not nothing. Even when I can't go anywhere because to leave the apartment is to lose money, I look to the big things of New York. It's very beautiful. All these buildings, trees, the way the sky changes color, the way the trees have different seasons. I can't imagine what it's like to live inside in Serra, in the winter especially, with nowhere to go, looking to a brick wall with no space to move. It hurts me. I feel sad for Tita, but also for me, because her story makes me think one can't predict what will happen in this life. Thank you, and welcome to your first session of your senior workforce program. Ah. <laughs> Except instead of being alone, you, you have a lot of people here with you. It is so. <laughs> so what we just heard was somebody who is there for one reason, to find a job, and ends up in what you call the undrowning, el desahogo and talking and talking. So can you talk a little bit first about the power of talking? Um, yeah, so, you know, ya tu sabes how not to drown in a glass of water. Um, the idea comes from como no te, no te ahogues en un vaso de agua, right? And the idea of how do we undrown is either through crying or to 
talking it out. And unfortunately, you know, in Kara's life, she's so busy and working and taking care of everybody. <laughs> She doesn't ever actually get to tell her story until she joins the senior workforce program. But what's really interesting, and, I, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about Malang and how amazing she is, <laughs> is my book launch, but my brand is community, so let's do it. So, you know, writing a novel, I mean, I don't know who's a writer here, but like the way that I was taught in MFA program was this idea that what a writer needs is a room of their own and they're by themselves in a room and, and like sometimes they have the woods outside and I don't know. And it's very isolated. And what I have found as I've, as I've moved through writing now that I've had so many books is that writing could include your community. And that's a beautiful thing. And you know, I wrote, this book had many versions. I started in 2017. And I wrote one version and I wrote another version. And then I had the last three weeks before I had to submit the book for publication. And they were probably the hardest three weeks that I had in many, many years because I was working 24 hours a day and I was kind of losing my mind because I couldn't tell what I was doing anymore. I was so deep in changing the syntax. Is she speaking in Spanish? Will she be ESL? Will she go back and forth? And lucky for me, at this moment, I was, trying to tell my language what was happening and like prepositions and it should it be of or to or what. And she said, send me a few pages. And she helped me actually. I was like, oh my God, you are ESL too. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like a gift because one night, New Year's Eve, yep. she came to my house and she literally read the novel to me. And it was like an epiphany because it's a monologue. And to have an amazing performer, Project Ula, brilliant friend, read the book back to me and us work through like what wasn't working was such a gift. So in some ways, like when I think about desahogo, I was also desahogándome contigo, mujer, because it was hard. And I think like what I always appreciate about the community I was raised in, you know, was that I don't know how the women in my life, in their apartments, allowed a lot of space for people to come and sit and just cry. And you're like, ¿qué hace llorando? Tú estás desahogándose. He broke up with somebody. And I'm like, and I would see like my mom, she would do her errands and the person would be there still doing their thing. And, and how beautiful it is that there's space for the undrowning, right? Through coffee, through eating, through talking. I mean, and. I, you know, I wanted to read this part because it's about gentrification. Tita's being kicked out of her apartment. And one of the things we talk about gentrification about, oh, it's about, you know, um, we get priced out, but like really, we get communityed out. Like literally like the interdependent structures that we've created through our families that allow for us to thrive, you know, childcare, elder care, all these different things. That's what we're really losing, which has like an incredible cost. And in some ways, like, I feel like I'm trying more and more to think about how do you hold a community together? And I feel like this book is about that, like how this character, Gata, is like trying to hold the community together. And you've talked too, when you talk about community, you know, at a certain point, I remember a potential title would have been something like an immigrant hand, the immigrant handbook, right? So it's meant to be useful, uh, you know, there's, tips in there. And one of the things that you talk about sometimes is the power of chisme too, right? So it's not just el desahogo, it's the, what is the chismo, chismo centro in the community and the information that it carries. And so I wonder, you know, in the case of Tita, she also gets kicked out because of water, because she has a lavadora, she has a washing machine. <laughs> it's like, you know, how not to drown in a lavadora and get kicked out. <laughs> So in terms of you know, being here in a community space, celebrating you in your neighborhood, you know, in the introduction, they, they mentioned the word neighbor like four times. What do you hope that this book illustrates in regards to that, like neighborhood, community ties? I mean, it's weird. I don't really hope or have any agenda with the book. Yeah. I'm kind of like, the book is out there. And I love the way it's received, that it's received in a different way by different people, right? Like the oh, different yes. aspects of the book get read and come back to me in these really interesting ways. But I do think it was fun. Like throughout the book, there'll be all these forms. Like there's like a, a lease, there's like 
um, security questions, all these different things that we have to go through the bureaucracy of life. And, um, and one of the, you know, and when I was doing them, I was like, you know what? I was evicted from an apartment because I didn't know the laws. I'm going to, I'm going to put it in here. I'm going to put right. it in how you could keep your apartment. Yeah. So if someone, I was already like, I was a professor and I still got kicked out of my apartment mm -hmm. because I didn't know the laws. And I said, wow, like, I want people who read this book. It is like a handbook. Right. Not only does Gaura have, write this down. She has a lot of advice. <laughs> Learn a this from of, me. Lot of unsolicited advice. You need it. Gaura will give it to you about everything. But I also wanted to weave in there, like, you know, the different, thi how to, like, how to deal with uh, cops. Like, how, like, all these things are in there. Um, because, yeah, like, I know for a fact that my books have been, for better or worse, a gateway to reading, but also like a way for people to get to know their neighborhood. Mm. So I, I was like, you know, this is my fourth book. I'm going to start entering stuff in there, you know? Mm. I love this. <laughs> so has, who's read this book in here? Yeah, OK. What's a, what's a character or a scene that somebody wants Angie to talk about right now? Yeah, she flips the, you know, she's there to receive help and then she ends up dictating, talking. She uses it almost like a like a therapist session, 12 therapist sessions. And, and, but, and along the way, we end up learning a whole bunch about like how to keep your apartment, put so and so on the lease, etc. You had something to say. Yeah, I'd love to hear you talk about Kara's relationship with her son. So Kara yes. is a lovable character, and she's funny as anything, but she's also complicated. Absolutely. And a difficult mother. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could talk about that relationship mm -hmm. without spoiling the plot. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's interesting because it's already been spoiled by all the reviewers, strangely. Like, for some reason, people write the entire story in the reviews. They're like, and this happened, and they'll quote, like, the ending. I don't know. It's, like, really bizarre what's happening with this book. But, um, and what I've realized is that the book is, is an experience. You can't spoil the plot because you actually have to read it. I could tell you exactly what happens, and you won't know what happens in the book. Because Cara Romero, like she says, you ask her about mangoes, she talks about yuca. That's right. <laughs> so I could tell you it's about the fact that she lost her son. Um, her son left her um, 10 years before 2008, when the book is happening. And, um, and she hasn't seen him. And she's been looking for him and looking for him. And we learned that the reason that she lost her son is because she wanted him to be strong and r raised him, you know, like to man up in all these different ways because he was soft and he was different and sensitive and she didn't know what, how to make space for her son and her son finally left and you know and we could assume that he was queer we could assume a lot of things about his lifestyle it's not specifically said but um for sure like writing this book you know i have a son he's 14 years old and what was really fun about it is that i and my, my niece mia also my niece <laughs> They became, again, like how to bring your community into the book. It's like, I was reading it out loud and they were just like, eh, you're being a little too easy on them. And I'm like, what? What, what are you talking about? So much was about disciplining, spanking, um, you know, trying to figure out how to keep your kids in tr out of trouble, right? And my, and my niece and my son were like very helpful in helping me see how much they forgive even when they've experienced certain things, not that I spanked my kid, but <laughs> he has stories, <laughs> you know? And, and it really helped me give the mother more breath in some ways to get the point of view of them when they listen to the parts of the story. So yeah, and in the end, the book really became about mothering, right? Because the sister mothers in a very different way, Kara mothers in a very different way, um, Lulu mothers in a very different way, um, and I wanted to show like the tensions and in some ways they all are doing something right and they're all doing something very wrong, wrong, whatever that is. But so it is a complicated character and she isn't, you don't simplify that. This is a complicated character with a lot of prejuicios and you know, she's working them through, working through them. And I don't know if you would agree, but you know, by the end there's a growth 
there's something that she doesn't stay exactly the same throughout the whole book. And meanwhile, she's working it out for herself. All we hear is her. There's no intervention from somebody telling her what she might think. It's a, it's a continual process of self-discovery through El Desahogo and through talking. One thing that I love, and I, I've said this before, about Dominicana, for example, is the use of animales, animals, or uh, to talk about the experience of whatever is happening in, 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 uh, for the humans. You kind of use it as a metaphor or uh, parallelo. And then in this book, what I see is that, yes, she's talking about yuca, but somehow she laughs in, 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 you know, she solves the mystery <laughs> of mango. Yes. Of mango. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. So, no. But, you know, like, I was really interested in, you know, what does it look like when you can have a sustained conversation with a person for, like, 30 minutes and really just be a exquisite listener, right? And allow for the complexity and the contradictions and really s see the nuance, right? Like I would say, I, I will implicate myself as a younger person, right? Like this is the, the interviewer, she's right. a younger person. And sometimes I would enter a room as a younger person, my mother's here to a task, come back from college, and I had a lot of opinions about what was right and wrong. Right. And I would be like, but I'm right about this and everyone's homophobic and everyone's racist and everyone's everything. And I'm right because I've studied and I read books and whatever it is. And I realized I wasn't listening to anybody. Mm. I was basically just mm. imposing mm. something on someone's experience when there's so much wisdom and lived experience. And what I hope like is mm. by listening to Gada, like you're forced to listen to Gada for yes. five hours, basically, <laughs> right? Yeah. That you allow for all her complexity and you're just like, oh, she's racist, she's homophobic, she's this. Actually, no, if you sit with her long enough, you start understanding it's not as simple, right? Like she might be, you know, really afraid for her son because her son may be queer, but at the same time, she's taking care of her neighbor, elder neighbor who is queer, mm -hmm. right? And to the end, she takes care of this and neighbor. Sabrina, the and Sabrina. And Sabrina, the, there's like an, another neighbor and she protects her in another way. Mm -hmm. So even if someone might say certain things and act certain way, like there might be other actions that n complicate all these different things that we constantly talk about in our communities, like colorism and homophobia and sexism, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and she figured it out for herself, which is the beautiful thing. I mean, you, you, you can sort of picture or understand that the interviewer who doesn't want to have kids, doesn't wear makeup, right? There's she might be queer herself, you know, but it, she never lectures or protests. There's something that just comes out naturally. Um, so I know we wanted to talk about comunidad, and we wanted to talk about all the helpful tips in there and the desahogo. Is there anything else when you look at these faces, particularly in this neighborhood, that you wanna, <laughs> that you wanna uplift? about the process of writing this book, about being here today. Just really curious about your experience as an author with you this know, I, I keep thinking of you, Maleng, because I'm going to throw it back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know her, one of um, Maleng's many jobs is that she's a project doula. And what a project doula is that she midwives projects into the world. And, you know, and in some ways it was very funny because when she started reading Cara Romero to me, you know, I, I was like, oh, we don't need so much of this stuff because we were reading it like a monologue. So I cut out like 15 to 20,000 words from the book. But what was funny is that I learned a lot in this process because I realized, oh, this is not a play. This is a novel. <laughs> and then I had to spend two more weeks bringing back everything I had cut out. <laughs> because in order for it to work as a novel, it needed all this other stuff. But the process, regardless, right? Like I feel like as a writer, I don't know, there's something about capitalism maybe, or the ways that we're trying to get things done, that we try to be so efficient, right? Like, we, we want everything to work, like the recipe to work, right? But I was like so radically inefficient with this book in a way that I felt like I spent a lot of time on the wrong road that in the end led me to this magic in the book that I feel like could have only happened by me cutting everything out and bringing it all back in and having people listening to the book and having people read it back to me. Um, and I feel like 
I guess like the big thing is like, it's okay to make time, even though you feel like you're wasting time as if it feels good to you. You know what I mean? But I think that we're so discouraged to lose time, like as if, like what? So I always think like it's a shortcut. The shortcut to something wonderful is act or true is like being present and just honoring the ways you get lost on the path. Mm, Which has got us totally lost on the path. <laughs> Absolutely. And you sent, you know, when I first read the novel or part of it, uh, it was always already uh, mediated by footnotes from the interviewer. It was very centered on it. It was supposed to be a translation of a Spanish conversation. You know, so by the time that what we see here, it's like cara completamente raw, right? It's her, she's taking complete ownership. She's like, doesn't care. She's digressing 50 times. She's just going for it. And the interviewer only has that a little thing at the end, you know? Um, so that was also another beautiful thing to watch. It's just her completely coming into self and being like, yo voy a hablar, and write that down. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I'm looking at the time. Correct me if I'm wrong. I thought I had 10 minutes and then open it up. So yes, cool. So quien más? Who wants to, uh, yeah, tell me. I don't have a question. I have a comment, Angie. You know, the, I finished reading the book in two days. It was yes. easy read, interesting read, and totally relatable. And I'm sure that for those that have read it or will read it, it'll be relatable as well. But I wanted to say thank you for uh, displaying to the rest of the world the resiliency and in the face of adversity um, of our people, right? Um, that in no matter how adverse or how many challenges, we find a way and we find hope in everything. So the astrologer, absolutely hilarious. But in her own way, she found the truth in what the astrologer was saying in her daily life, right? So at the end, the way the story ends, and I won't give it up, yeah. but it's beautiful. She's like, this is what she was talking about. This is the check. That's right. And it is so, it gives me the goosebumps because mm -hmm. it's, it's so real. And we make it happen and it's beautiful. So thank you for putting it out there for everyone else. <laughs> and even there, it's like the power of narrative because Alicia is writing, the psychic yeah. is writing to her. So she's, yeah. she's making meaning yeah. out of narrative. So that's yeah. true. Like I, I read my horoscope every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, that doesn't. That, that's bullshit. That's not true. And then it's like, oh yeah. I'm gonna pay attention to this. But it's like, trouble. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Save money. Nah, that's not. Right. No, but I, I do have a question. Yes. So, Soledad, let it rain coffee, Dominicana, how not to drown in a glass of water. What is different for you? You were talking about the process of writing it, and I know this was this was special. This is a special case. But how do you see the, the? Is it a progress? Is it is it a roller coaster? Is it like would you change something? Would you go back? Everything has a. I mean, I'm sure everything has its I own mean, value. But how do you see it? I mean, I don't know. A God, it's like. Every book was like its own very different journey. And I feel like the thing that's most interesting for me is that every book is very different from the last is the way I tell the story. And I realized I love constraints. Like this book had a very specific constraint that I created and I found a lot of freedom in the constraint of the 12 weeks. You know what I mean? And I think that I had so much material in this character that was constantly like chatting in my ear. So creating a constraint really excited me, but also like, I feel so privileged because I feel free as a writer. Mm -hmm. And I can't say that was true as a younger writer. When I, you know, when Soledad came out, I was, there was only like three or four of us publishing in English, the Dominican experience with major publishers. And it was like very lonely. And we were writing about something and not really in conversation directly with anyone else, right? But now there's so much stuff out there, right? There's more translations, more. So I'm just like, you know what? I could do whatever I want. Like I'm gonna throw these forms in here. And like, that's a privilege mm -hmm. too, because that means I've liberated myself to a degree where Kara could say everything she wants. I think a younger writer, this is the beauty of aging, you know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> there is some beauty. Um, is like a younger writer might have been more afraid yep. to let her, like she literally embodies this wild self, right? 
and in the ways that I admire the women in my life that have that. Like, I don't know if I have it, but I really loved it in her. <laughs> and, um, and that's what's changed, that I'm, I'm, I learned from her, right? Like, yo soy así, and that's the way I am. What do you want? You know what I mean? Like, I love my son, and I hate him too. And like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's not a popular thing, and cancel me, so what? <laughs> I would also ask you, uh, thank you for that question, because what I see as a little bit different or exciting is your use of humor and actually even satire in some of these forms, right? Like the lease from the landlord who has no soul or something like that, you know, or no feelings, yeah. right? So uh, it, it, that is interesting when you talk about liberation mm -hmm. and then you talk about humor. I mean, and now, you know, I'm sure you all know, you know, in your communities how we respond to hur hurricanes and stuff in Puerto Rico right now and the resilience, but humor is actually a freaking part of it, how we deal, so reír para no llorar. So she's funny and she cracks herself up, ha! But all the I, time. I cracked myself up. <laughs> like I was, and I think I needed her. Like I needed Cara in my life because, you know, it w I wrote it during the Trump presidency and I was really terrified yes. what was gonna happen to our country, to our people, to the laws. I mean, I'm st I still am, but a little less than I was during Trump. And I needed someone to make me laugh. Mm. You know, and she gave, she made me laugh. And her optimism, like in the end, like I was thinking, you know, are we allowed to have a happy ending in a literary book? Are we really? <laughs> like, will people take me seriously? <laughs> but you know what? People don't take me seriously anyway if they don't want to. The people who recognize the gifts will take you seriously. Yeah. Yeah. And the people who don't, they won't, no matter what you do. Doesn't matter what you wear, how you talk they will still dismiss you. And this is something also like really interesting. You know, I, was, I shared with um, Maleng a review um, in Goodreads because I thought it was a perfect for her <laughs> to laugh because, you know, Cara Romero speaks in ESL, right? So the English, the syntax, I play with that, right? To show the breadth of, of her life and her, the richness of her language. And there was a reviewer who says, I don't understand, Angie Cruz can't write in English. Like, <laughs> why would anyone publish a book that has so many mistakes, you know? <laughs> and she gave her like, what star? <laughs> and I was like, what a gift this reviewer did for us, because I laughed, we laughed forever. Because <laughs> we were like, of course she doesn't get it. But what it made me think too, this is what it feels like to be here. And for yes. people to totally yes. dismiss you, because you're speaking two languages or you're moving in two languages and people completely presume you incompetent, which is fucking ridiculous. We're gifted. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> Learn this from me. Yes, yes. And, and it also must feel, this is what it feels like to be here right. in which we totally get how she speaks, right? Is the absolute, which with the other two reviewers above the one star, who had a conspicuously non-Latina name, you know, the other two were like, oh my God, like this is amazing, her use of language. You know, it really, it made me look at one star and go, ay mamita, it's not for you. It's not for you, you're not supposed to get it. It's okay, like <laughs> calm it down, you know? So here though, it's like, yeah, si se habla. Right? So. But not only that, we enjoy yes. every single moment. Every single, I mean, we were just talking before, like, how am I going to translate it? <laughs> like, I'm going to leave it like that, and then I'm going to use all the parts, and I'm just going to change them to English or something, because yes. they're just perfect. You don't yeah. want them. Yes. Oh, that is how I do <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So my question, two-part question. Question number one. How did you come up with the title? And the second part is, you said before that there was a moment when you were writing the book that you were not sleeping, it was like a 24 hour job, which of course at some point you did, right? <laughs> so I want to know, as a creative person, like, do you have dreams when you're creating? Do, do the characters come to you and speak to you? Maybe you're not all the way sleeping, but you're like in that somber state. Yeah, so the title comes from the, you know, the expression, no te hago es un vaso de agua. But, you know, it's interesting because I think that expression, Tita's an interesting person because Tita is actually, a, there's a Tita in my life. And one day I visited my grandmother and Tita said, 
when she found out I was a writer, my grandma says, ¿Tú sabes que ella escribe el libro? And Tita was like, oh, pero escribe de mí. Like, write about me. <laughs> and she's like, my story is very sad. And she told me her story. Like, it was too sad to even write in the book. I couldn't write her story. But I wanted to have her name in the book mm -hmm. because if she ever comes across the book, she'll see that she's in the book. She's like, escribe de mí. Like, tell my story. Mm -hmm. And she went and told me this very sad story. <laughs> and then I told the story to someone else in the community. And they said, ay, ya siempre se está ahogando un vaso de agua. <laughs> and I said, no, I think she has real problems. <laughs> like, these are not drowning in a glass of water problems. These are real problems. But when you're in a community where a lot of people have a lot of problems and there's a lot of resilience, right? Yes. No, because, you know, I lost my toe and, and, you know, in my hand and I still, you know, I opened the can and I did this and, like, like the people without even body parts are, like, doing things that are impossible and you're just like oh wait like this is the problem the problem is that there's been so much resilience mm. <laughs> that when someone comes with a real problem like I might lose my apartment something's wrong with my kid or whatever they're like oh just you know but do you have two hands do you have two hands <laughs> <laughs> do you see what I'm saying it's like really it's crazy so in the title I want it to be like that right like that she's saying how she's teaching you how not to drown in a glass of water in some ways but you're also seeing how they're all kind of drowning. Mm -hmm. The system is evil. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to survive it, you need each other. Yes. And like, I think that's the main question, yes. like the main message. But yes. the other thing you asked was, oh, do I dream? Yeah, like, I think <laughs> that it's, it, you know, like, gotta, like, sometimes, like, literally, when I was writing her, she would just start speak, I would just ask her a question, and she would start answering me. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of a weird, um, presence of this character and she continues to talk mm -hmm. so I don't know what I'm gonna do with her <laughs> I can see cara se te monta like totally I'm like it's you're weird Andy, you're no but it happened to me I was really yeah. shy about sharing about my book and cara says it's not your moment to be shy I want to be a talk star <laughs> I want to be a star go go tell people about me and I said, okay, I'll talk about Cara Romero. It's not about me, it's about her. And Cara and her neighbor have dreams. And Cara will have you know that Cara is much better at analyzing these dreams than her neighbor is. She's much better at dreams. Yeah. And then the glass of water too is how the book begins. Can you permit me to have a glass of water? And then the beautiful thing about the silent interviewer is that there comes a moment in which she just offers her the glass of water before she has to ask. Mm -hmm. And that's like, for me, that was a nice little like, ah, okay, we've arrived, we're home, we're not drowning in this glass. Mm -hmm. Anything else that folks, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Dale, dale tu, que you're the translator. The connection also with the water is with, with, with the sister. Because yes. the reason why she's drinking so much water is because something happened and then she doesn't tell, she doesn't tell the sister and then that, I think that opens the Pandora box mm -hmm. and all the conversations. So I think, I think it's, it's a, it works. Yes, it works. It works. It works. A ver. Uh, really, how has your perspective changed from the time you're writing on the, your book? Or like, how has your perspective changed from writing from the time you have? <coughs> Ooh, nice question. How has my perspective, perspective changed, changed throughout the time you've been writing? Um, about writing? I definitely feel that writing has helped me be more generous with people I don't agree with. Um, I, I, you know, I've always thought I wrote my way toward forgiveness um, to people that I thought were really, really not so great to me. Hmm. And I think that's how it helps, like, in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did she answer your question or did you have a more specific one? No? Okay. <laughs> So first of all, just a quick comment before I ask the question is, whoever did the audiobook, <laughs> so good. <laughs> like, uh, the, exactly the voice that I'd hear if I were like talking to someone, like I'm a social worker, and so like, that often happens, right? You're talking to someone about one thing, and it's like, you're, you're all of a sudden talking about their whole life story, and everything's just tumbling, tumbling out, and so it really resonated with me a lot, and also reminded me of like my Diaz. <laughs> um, and I think also the part that I, that I had a question about, and you don't, you know, without giving specifics, but, um, I just got to the part where the sisters towards the end are having the conversation and it was really about kind of like seeing the way that uh, 
people within kind of the same generation process trauma, right? This in this case was shared trauma with their mother. Um, what was going through your mind, I guess, when with writing that relationship out between Angela and Gara? Oh, and the intergenerational trauma. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I think that one of the things when we think about like corporal punishment, like you know, these are legacies that are handed to us that come from you know, colonialism and slavery and all these things. And it's not like you learn to do these things from other people. And in some ways you have to contextualize why Kara makes certain choices for her son, right? So by going back to the mother was like sort of giving reason to why some of her behavior was happening and why her sister wanted to change the pattern, right? Like her sister did not want to be like her mother, right? She wanted to do it differently. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question or a comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> So I just wanted to say I'm teaching a bunch of English classes in college right now. And I have quite a few students who are bilingual. Most of them are from the Dominican Republic, some are from Puerto Rico. And I have a hard time getting them to want to read and write in class. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot of things I've been telling them. When you write your essays, when you write your papers, when you write about your life, you can put Spanish in your work. Like mm -hmm. You can totally make words up. You can play with language. Like People do it all the time. And so one of them asked me, well, aren't we going to read like traditional literature in this class? Why are you giving us all this literature about tell people? And I said, because I want you to know that your story is valid to tell, too. Because you have so many beautiful stories. And don't not tell them because you feel like the English is not traditional or your English is not good enough. Because I'm country, and my English is not traditional. <laughs> 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 tell my story, I'm still going to write. So I just want to you know, thank you for that. Because I'm always looking for stuff to give them to read where they see themselves. Mm -hmm. And so this is definitely something that I'm going to share with them that I think of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The future for Dominican authors. I mean, I think it's really exciting because, like I said, I think the more books we have out there, the more possibility there is with how we tell our stories. Um, it just adds, like, to the vocabulary, the visual vocabulary. I was just um, having lunch with Elizabeth Acevedo, who is, you know, a wonderful Dominican writer. If you don't know her work, you should check it out. And um, and she read this book, and she's coming out with a book, and she's like, oh, no, I think we have some overlapping imagery, but maybe that's cool. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, well, it's the same hood, so <laughs> we're going to have overlapping things, right? And this is adding to, like, it's almost like we're really sustaining and affirming a visual, lingual, imaginative and real vocabulary, right, for Dominican literature. So more can happen, right? The more of us that flex and play, the more interesting things that could happen in the works. Yeah. We have more than 30 published this year. That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> that, that it will only work if we buy the books. Uh -huh. yeah. Because that's, at the end, it's a, it's a, it's a market, it's a negocio, mm -hmm. and it, the book doesn't sell, they don't publish more Dominicans, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a, a vicious cycle because not only then the movies don't get made and the TVs don't get, I mean, it's just like a wild. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for all your movies. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have something? Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say, speaking of movies, like, do you see this as like a play, as like a movie or something? Mm -hmm. Um, it's, everyone wants, is talking about it maybe being a play, so it's, I mean, it's just been out one week, but it feels, <laughs> it feels like Cara Romero wants to be a star, so, <laughs> and the audiobook is, like, very popular, like, very popular, it's Boquita, what's her full name, Rosemary? Rosemary Yeah, she's, like, a very well-known Dominican comedian who does the audiobook, and, and a lot of people really love it, and it's it's done like a radio drama, so with sound effects, and you know, so I think that it's, it's people are really thinking about it in that way. Boquita is ask your mom. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Yes. Well, this is a, a, more of a comment than a question, but I it, it, it made me happy and it was very relatable, but it also kind of saddened me, the fact that they want Gara, or the system rather, wants Gara, needs Gara to get a job, to find a job. You need to get a job, you're in this program because you need to get a job. Mm -hmm. But it is invaluable, incalculable, yeah. all that she gives to her community. Yeah. There's no price on that. And the fact that, you know, obviously the system is the way that it is, she must have a job because X, Y, and Z. But I just, it touched me a lot coming from a lot of people. Like, a lot of people have big families. But it was just like, ugh. So, so lovely, but still kind of heartbreaking. But I mean, you know, it should be heartbreaking. I mean, the reality is that why don't we have a system that took care of all these women that work 25, 30 years in jobs and we're totally like laid off in you know in the great recession why couldn't we have a system that by the age of 55 or 56 like if you put in your time that you're just taken care of yeah. because it's not like they're sitting at home doing nothing <laughs> <laughs> you know they are doing a lot of labor and you know i like to say like she doesn't have a job but she's employed by the community right um and that's really valuable and we could have a government that decides to take care of you after all that service, yeah. I think, because it is a value. It's like, there's no way her, her sister, there's a sister named Angela and she's younger. There's no way Angela could have saved to buy a house if she didn't have all that free childcare. Right. There's just no way, mm -hmm. right? Like that subsidization helps people progress in the way that we dream. <laughs> So I don't know who's in the room, but to the question about the future for Dominican authors, like if you would imagine that someone might perhaps be a young Dominican author, <laughs> what might you tell them in this moment about writing? I think that, you know, if you're a writer, you have to write. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to read widely and like be curious and, you know, and seek mentors and take good classes, um, but also not to give up, right? Like, I feel like I have a story of one that didn't, I mean, I almost did give up, let me be honest, right? I think my community didn't let me give up. Mm. I think I would have given up, but people like Emily, mm -hmm. who was like, always like, you're amazing, you're brilliant, you're gonna find a publisher one day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had four years where I had Dominicana after two books. Right? And it just went around and I got letter after letter after letter. There's no market. It's too quiet. It's not working. Like, and then there was one editor that loved it. But it took four years, right? Um, and in that process of waiting for someone to maybe publish that book, I just kept, I started this book, right? So in some ways, you have to do the thing that you feel urgency to do and to trust that the work, if you're, you're working at it, We'll find a place. And before we close, I want to acknowledge also, as somebody was saying earlier, you know, they said, Angie opened the doors for me. And then I said, you know, how many people at the end of Angie's life will be able to say she opened the doors for me? It's a lot of people. So in a way, the labor that Angie has done for writers, et cetera, is invaluable. And it's very Cara Romero-like. So thank you for your invaluable work in opening doors, in cleaning up, you know, uh, <laughs> desahogos, and in encouraging folks the way that Cara does. So thank you so, 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 so much, and I hope we celebrate together today. So I think that there's some wine and water and some picadera, and I'm happy to sign books, and I don't know what happens now. <laughs> My question that I always ask, um, I forgot, sorry. <laughs> but um, I'm always like, I love knowing what type of music, you know, like an author is listening to, or like if you had a playlist for this song, or like a song that would be playing in the background for your character, like what would it be? Um, you know, it's interesting. I did, I do listen to a lot of music, but unfortunately, and during pandemic, when I wrote this book, I lived with a 14 year old <laughs> and he dictated everything I listened to. Fortunately, he listened to a lot of bachata. So I tried to get him to play 
bachata from the 2000s. Uh -huh. So that way it would be connected to the work. But there was a lot of merengue bachata. Yeah. Like Aventura and all this stuff. Yeah. And she mentions two specific songs in the book so you can go find them. <laughs> <laughs> Treasure hunt. You know, I don't want to know. No, I'm sorry. I, I, to the... The possible author. <laughs> <laughs> the, author the, the imaginary possible author over there. And this is after 20 years also writing. Don't be afraid to write about the Cala and Romero's out there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those people that, those characters are in your life. And as with Dominicana, what did you, like, nobody's going to read that. That's about my mom. That's about me. That's about everybody. You know, like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. we, we need to write about those. We also have a special surprise for Angie. Thank <laughs> you. 